Let's give him a hand clap of praise. God bless you. Amen. I love those songs that are bride specific. Amen. They all are, but that one is really talk about our age right here where we're at. So God bless you. Good to be in the house of the Lord. Good to have everybody here today. We got a full house as full as we can get. Good to see Brother and Sister Dale back there in the back. We got to start moving them toward the front. Keep them, get them out of the back back there. Amen. Good to be in the house of the Lord. Brother Terrence is on. He's doing good. He's outside uh, watching in. He and Sister Lisa, so just keep them in your prayers. Everything's good. We're all heading in the right direction. And uh, Wednesday night, Brother Luis will be speaking for us. On Wednesday at 7 o'clock, we'll do this again next Sunday at 10, just like we did before until we give you further notice. But um, Brother John and Sister Alicia, we uh, they called about the uh, mother there the other day. and It's just the separation time, and but we know that we had a prophet go back into the curtain across the curtain of time and he just kind of wiped out all fear yes. all fear of death Amen. of what's going of what's going to happen with that little sting if so that happens but we're going to be doing the service at 11 o'clock on Wednesday in Atlanta brother John will get the directions for us and we'll be um, speaking down there Wednesday at 11 so uh, thank you for doing that we appreciate any time we can help be any help of anyone. And we appreciate the Lord for letting us have another week, another time, another time to come to service. I, I say smiling faces, but some of you I can't see. So make your eyes smile. That's the way to do it. That, uh, Zoe Black, back there, she, her whole face smiles. So you can see when she's smiling, her eyes are all smiling. So God bless you. Good to be in the house of the Lord. We're going to one more, we're going to do one more part on the why do the heathen rage. Let's turn to the book of Psalms. This will be part two, and then we'll get back on to the two spirits. You know, I was thinking yesterday, we are talking about two spirits because uh, there's one influence in you or the other, one of the two, and then sometimes both of them are, right. amen, because we're still humans. <clears throat> but we, as being human beings, though, and, and we're not, and I like what Brother Branham said. He said, you know, he said, God is a segregationist. We don't segregate by color or any of that, but we segregate by family, by Christianity, by, by as the song said, sons and the daughters of God. Not everybody is a son and daughter of God. Not by, not by genetic birth, by the new birth. Everybody's son and daughter of God by birth, but not by the new birth. That puts you in another category, and God puts you in that category. So under that, we see that the world is going to rage, but this part two, we look coming over into um, death, but we look over here and we see that, that still there is that second power that's working today in here to try to get you to disbelieve the Word of God. Amen. All right? And but what he's doing though is what I was thinking. He's getting you to disbelieve the word of God by believing part of the word of God. He not, he, Satan has never said this Bible's wrong. No. But what he done was come down like we were talking about in Nicaea. He came down into those men and diluted and polluted and added to the written word with no Holy Spirit revelation, which was Satan's revelation of the Trinity and all the different thing, all the different false doctrines, and then that man Satan has now moved over into the message of the hour and he's teaching false doctrine again. So uh, we're still dealing with him, but I still want to cover this again. I, <clears throat> I brother, uh, what brother Collier read, we're going to read another one in Psalms three, uh, but the book of Psalms is is really important to me to see your life because. David, as we were talking talk about last Sunday and what we're going to talk about again, David was anointed to be king. He knew it. He had a revelation. He knew he was the only one. There's not ever been two kings of Israel. There's only been one. All right? So he knew he was going to be king, and then he comes up and he, 
and he has all these troubles and trials and and you know he's a great conqueror he kills Goliath, uh, Goliath but he has problems with Saul and we'll get into that in a minute won many battles but he was drove out of his kingdom as a rejected king and uh, this is where we look and see that that you and I today if you get nothing else get this you and I are anointed to be king and princes of this earth. Revelation 5 tells us, the whole Bible tells us that we're coming back to an Eden condition and we're to rule and reign on this earth. All right? <clears throat> but this is temporary then. You're gonna let, we're going to let the heathen rage. We're going to let the heathen do what they want to do. But when we come back to the bottom line, this is our earth. This is ours. We came from this earth. We came from the spoken word of God back in Genesis 1. And as Adam ruled and reigned the earth with Eve, the bride of Jesus Christ with Jesus Christ is going to rule and reign for an eternity. So God bless you. Let's bow our heads just for a moment. Remember all the ones that are sick. Many different ones. There's other churches now that are, that are dealing with the virus. So um, we pray that they will, uh, they will overcome. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the day that you give us and the hour that we're living in. And for a good church to go to and a good family, Lord, church family to be a part of. We pray, Lord, now that you would sanctify us for this journey. Be with us, Lord, in the furtherment of this service. Anoint the hearers, Lord, but anoint the speaker, Father, so that you can do the speaking to the people. And, Lord, they'll get something from you today, and it'll not just be a meeting of minds and different things, but, Lord, we will hear straight from you. Father, we pray that you just heal the sick, be with the ones that are not here. Lord, anoint the ones for our journey that we're in be with the little bride around the world, the different ones in the foreign fields. We've all kind of all been cut off where we can't see each other much, but we can talk. And Lord, we know there's one thing for sure. We miss each other, Lord. We miss even the fellowship here, Lord, as being downstairs and being distancing in the, in the pews today, Lord. We know we've, we're scattered in the way that the world sees it, but Lord, we should be united more under you, Father. United under the Word of God, what the Word says, not what man says. So, Lord, just be with us today in the furthermore of this service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Psalms 2 verse 1 says, Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? Because what is all this world? It's all vanity. Nothing you can depend on. Wealth, economy, economics, presidents, politics. The only one thing you can depend on, that's the Word of God. Amen. Amen. And that's what David did because his absolute came back to, I'm going to be a king. So whatever happens, but he was still human. And I was reading the other night where he would lay across his bed and he says, my bed is wet with my tears. Amen. Crying out to God for his people and for deliverance and for the things that he needed as a human. And that's the same way with we are now. <clears throat> doing the same thing. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. But I like this part. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. There's your promise. You may be seated in the Lord at his blessing to the reading of the word. Let's read Psalms 18, 1 as we <clears throat> enter into this for for David's life and we can put many other people's lives in here and we can we see that Jesus comes up to the Pharisees and, he, and when he was here uh, he comes up to the religious leaders of the day and he said well what's the difference in you persecuting me and persecuting my people you persecuted my prophets back in the Old Testament because Jesus Christ Christ was in those prophets so Jesus knew what, he, that what the religious people of the world had done to them back in the Old Testament or back in the prophetic time of Isaiah. Look at Isaiah. Isaiah was a wonderful prophet. He was a young man. But they cut him asunder. They cut him in pieces because he was a prophet. Many different people. During the time, and, and Jesus was not wondering, he said, well, don't worry if they hate you. They hated me in those prophets, and now they've hated me more because I'm standing here, I was reading yesterday in Luke, where they hated him because he called himself the Son of God. Because 
because the religious world knew that he was saying, I'm not a second person. I'm God Almighty in human flesh. And that's what they hated him for, and that's what they're going to hate you for. Amen. Amen? So when we look at this and we see why do the heathen rage, I hope you got something last week that, that, that we're talking about. Yeah, I'm talking about the guy that, that you know, as, I, as an example, you walk through Walmart or you come outside of Walmart and, you, you know, you're in this big cloud of, of Marlboro smoke and, and the guy's just puffing away, you know, and he's feeling fine and he's going to go get his beer and he's going to go home and he's feeling fine, but yet some of the bride of Jesus Christ are struggling with disease and struggling with this virus and struggling with the different things. And sometimes it makes you wonder, kind of like David, because that was the question, why do, in other words, Lord, why are these people so successful? Why does it seem like the guy that smokes a cigarette, you know, uh, has COPD and I'm just making it all worse. He's got, you know, he's, he's 200 pounds overweight, yet he never gets the virus. You wonder that. I mean, you, you, but, but as Christians, you have to know one thing's for sure. The footsteps of the righteous are ordered of the Lord. And I'll read you a quote in just a few minutes where Brother Brown says, These light affi- afflictions that are put on us are for our good. Amen. If you believe, but now see, you can get on the other side and be the old oh, woe is me, wowsy, wowsy, woo. Why is God doing this to me? Right? So that's kind of what David was, Lord, why do the heathen rage? In other words, why are they overtaking my kingdom? Why is my own son taking over my kingdom? Why is he, why am I having to go set up on the top of a mountain somewhere and, and look down on Jerusalem and there's my kingdom? Isn't that the way me and you look? You know, Brother Brown walked through the woods one day and found a cigarette pack. You know, he picked it up and, and the, the power of God gave him a, a sermon from it. But I'm sure what Brother Brandon was doing, just like we do, and I can't stand for anybody to throw anything out of a window and there's trash all over. This is just me, human. I'm just talking right now. All right? It just throw something out the window and you see all this stuff on the side of the road. Right. You know why? Because it's my property. Right. Yeah. Right. And thank God he's going to burn it off right. where that will all burn and it will be ashes, the prophet of God said. In Malachi 4, under the soles of our feet when we walk out into the millennium. There won't be a cheeseburger wrapper and lottery tickets we're going to have to step over. I'm telling you, I used to cut grass there at the city um, a couple years ago, and used to it was, you know, cigarette packs and beer cans. Now it's, um, now it's, uh, what's that stuff? Red Bull and lottery tickets or whatever, monster. It's all them energy drinks that people got enough energy to throw it out the window. And the lottery ticket, you know, that people now are going back and picking them up again, trying to look and see if somebody missed something. You see how the world's gone insane, you know? And it's just that way, but, but we polluted the world, like Brother Brown said. We have whatever advancement we've ever made, cars, planes, trains, whatever it is, we've always went toward the messing up part. But you and I must look at this. This is my property. And while I'm here, I'm going to do the best I can. This is, I'm just giving you a little admonition. Try to make something better than when you left. You know, I, you know me, or I've told you before, if I go through Walmart and I see something laying on the floor, I don't just kick it under the thing. I'll pick it up and set it up on a shelf. That's just me. I go through the post office and somebody's throwed a letter down or they something, I'd pick it up because I want to make something better. That's just humanity. But why not in the gospel should we be the same way? Right. That we should be crying out as we were reading in, <clears throat> in Romans <clears throat> where the whole world is waiting on the manifestation of the sons of God. Well, listen, the world's got to get bad <laughs> before we can start manifesting ourselves. Right. The world's got to get bad. Why would you need to have a manifestation of the sons of God when you got gas in your tank? You got a $50,000 automobile? You got a good job making a lot of money? And why do you need manifestation of the sons of God? <clears throat> That's just natural living like they're doing out there. 
But when you need God is when <clears throat> somebody like David says, Lord, why is this happening to me? But anytime that does happen to David, watch this right here. Psalms 18, 1. Now look at the caption there. It says, to the chief musician, the Psalm of David, the servant of the Lord. Look, who spake unto the Lord the words of this song in the day that the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies. See, it was a time that David had took over all of his enemies. There was a time when he was delivered from the hand of Saul. He said, I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. My God, my strength in whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from mine enemies. Listen, do not worry. Do not fear. The sorrows of death can pass me and the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. Whatever's happening out there, that's ungodly. Whatever's happening up there, out there in the world, that's an ungodly world out there. Even though they may say they're Christians and they may say that they believe in God, but the devil does the same thing. All right? So be careful when you say this person, he knows of God, but we know God. There's a lot of people who knows of Jesus Christ, but there's not many people that have an intimate relationship with him like we do. Amen? And that he has one back to us. This is not just a one-way street. Amen? Because that's what David saying, Lord, here I am, but so I shall be saved from mine enemies. Though I be compassed about, he said one time. The sorrows of hell compassed me about, verse 5. The snares of death prevented me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord. Isn't it really easy to get complacent and have all those things in life and you just say them little short prayers? I'm going to talk to you today. And just saying them little short prayers. Lord, bless us all. You know, it's good. I've got everything I'm going in the right direction. Just bless me. See you. Bye. But when you cry out to the Lord, when you have adversity, when you have a lot of things going on in your life, it makes for them long prayers. It makes for them prayers that are what? That have a little more, I say, more meaning to them than they did before. Because David, he right there at the first, he was anointed to be king. You know what he done? He went right back out and started herding sheep. But there was a seed planted. I talked about that seed the other day. It's not a seed of anything but a seed of the word of God. He got a word from Samuel. Now, remember, he didn't have a Bible to read per se. He had the Torah. He, he knew what Moses said. But here David, I don't think he walked out there and said, all right, I'm going to be this great king and I'm going to write this book of Psalms and I'm going to have a son named Psalm. God don't tell you everything when you start your journey. He, you know what he does? He wants to see if you believe what he's already said. That's right. There's the whole thing. He wants to make sure you believe and it's ingrained in your heart. Not this heart. In your, in, your, in your inner being, he wants to make sure that you understood what he said the first time. All right? Then that's what he did with David. David understood, not that his brothers, not even that Saul. Now, remember, Saul was chosen by Israel to be king. Amen? But God chose what? Man chose Saul. God chose David. Don't know who you're going to take. <laughs> Whose side are you going to take on that one? Amen? God chose David through Samuel, an anointed prophet for that day. So why can't you be the same thing? Why can't you be the anointed kings and priests that believes what God said to you through a prophet that gave you an anointing to leave this world with? To do something nobody had ever done before and it's take a body change. Amen. But we got to get past the why did the heathen rage? We, we got to get past the wowsy, wowsy, woo. Why is this happening to me? Why is God doing this to me? Well, I'll read you a few things here in just a little while because David, even in verse 6, look, in my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried unto my God. He heard my voice 
out of his temple, and my cry came before him even into my ears. Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations also of the hills moved and were shaken because he was wroth. There went up a smoke out of his nostrils and fire out of his mouth devoured. Coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens also and came down in darkness was under, under his feet. Just because David, a child of God, cried out to God, he moved heaven and earth to come down there and talk to him. Right. Now, you got to believe the same thing, that God moved heaven and earth to talk to you. Yes, Amen? Yes. Psalms 37, verse 23 says, The steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Though he fall, that just alleviates all the fall. Every time you fall, get back up. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. I have been young and now am old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging for bread. We've been through some narrow places before. We know all of us have. But God's never been so far away that you can't contact him. He is right there. Even David, when David said, Lord, why does the heathen rage? Who was he talking to? Who was he talking to? God. Because God was in the room with him. Who do you think he's talking to? He's not talking to the heathen. He's not talking to the devil. He's asking God a question. And where was God? He was standing right there. Same way with you and I. It's okay to question the things that go on. It's okay to question certain things that are happening in your life. But remember who you're talking to when you question them. You're talking to the Almighty. You're talking to your daddy. He's standing right there listening to what you got to say. Even though we may be in the wowsy wowsy woo, he's still going to go, hey, I'm right here. I mean, who do you talk to when you pray? Who do you talk to when you pray? Are you just praying out in the air? Is it just something that a ritual that you do that you say, well, I'm going to just say something and maybe, maybe somebody will hear what I said. No, right there, David, he's telling us the one before that. He said, I cried out to the Lord and he heard my prayer. You say, oh, God hadn't heard my prayer in years. Oh, please. Oh, please. You're alive. You're sitting here. You're listening to the word of God. You're doing something that most people would give. Uh, Brother Bob and I were talking the other day. You know, this is something that we have that, you know, Bill Gates and all the real rich men of the world. You think, boy, they're great. They're powerful. And they are. They got billions of dollars. But would you trade places with him? Oh, but I could take this bit. See, that's the devil. I could take this billions of dollars and I could build churches and I could take the message all around the world. No, your money would catch up with you. Whatever Bill Gates has got, and I'm just saying here, all any rich people in the world, they have zero to what you have. Because they're going, they know, they know they're coming to an end of life. And they don't have a clue if they're not born again. They don't have a clue what's going to happen. And he can't take that money with him. But what you've got, he can have if he wants it. But you got something that he can't touch. And I know I'm just trying to get in everybody's head here. Well, that's kind of hard. Strange. But there's a lot of room for some of us to get in their head. <clears throat> but we look and we see, though, we give honor. And we know we give honor to, to, you know, we honor the President of the United States. We honor all these different men, all right, because of the position that they hold. Even when you're working in a job, the Bible tells you if you're a servant, 
that you do what your master tells you to do. Even the Bible tells us that we're supposed to be that. Right. Uh, right? Okay? So that's just human. That's just us being, that makes us different from everybody else. Right. You know, somebody said the other day, said now the way people are working, that to get employee of the month, you just have to show up for two days in a row. In a row. Two days. Not two months or two weeks. Two days. So that's how the job market's got. I want you to be a better person than anybody that ever has worked for whoever or whatever. You understand what I'm saying? Because, look, that's the riches that I'm talking about. That was the riches that God saw David was a, had an honest and a contrite heart. David was trying his best without the baptism of the Holy Ghost in his soul. He had an anointing. He was anointed with the same thing that you're living with every day Amen. inside of you. Amen. And David still, he questions God, but that's okay. God didn't look at that. God looked at why he was doing what he did. David wanted to be right. Do you want to be right? I want to be a right person. Just even in my humanity, I want to be, and we fail every day. But we surely, for sure we want to be what God wants us to be. Not what man, but what God wants us to be. Let's look at Psalms 27 verse 1. Excuse me. We're going to read some scripture today just like we did last week. That's all right with you. <clears throat> I like reading scripture. Yes. Psalms 27 verse 1, a psalm of David. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Now, now here's David in Psalms 27. I know they're not written all in chronological order, but in Psalms 2, he says, Lord, why does the heathen rage? But now this is something you and I, stay awake, would you please? Good grief. Stay awake. This is worth more than any back of your eyelids will ever show you. Okay. Of whom shall I be afraid? Now, David has worked through something. Same way with you and I. In our journey, we work. Sometimes we, we get down in the pits and we say, why does the heathen rage and why is everything happening to me? Why do what? But we've got to come to a day of Psalms 27. Whom shall I fear? Right. Amen. The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even my enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Amen. Wow, what about that? Amen. Though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Now, that doesn't mean you're not going to have a little, maybe they call butterflies, Amen. human butterflies. You understand? Everybody's had them before Amen. because of, of the uncertain, because of the unseen. But you must do like David said, he put his heart. The inward part of him, he put at rest. The war should rise against me. What about somebody like David? He was a man of war. He physically went out and fought people and could have died. I was thinking this morning, I, I, I couldn't have been a general in the Confederate Army or any army because you know there's a certain amount of death. You're, you're, you're sending people out to battle and you know some of them's not coming back. Right? So it's a certain, there's a certain fear there even with you as being, <clears throat> talking about David here, there's a certain fear because of war is so uncertain. But what did he do? In this will I be confident. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. One thing, one thing that I have did, one thing have I desired of the Lord that I will seek after, what? That I may dwell in the house. Now, remember last Sunday we were talking about house. That house is not a house. It's a domain. It's a dominion. In my father's house are many mansions. And back in the old times and even now still in, in England and different places, they have a, a house, which would be the house of commons. They have a house of of Roberts, they have a house of Dale. They have all, it's, it's your domain. It's what you. It's what you're over to protect. So that's why he said, "I will dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life." 
Because remember, David didn't physically stay in the house of the Lord all the days of his life. He didn't go run and get in the temple and sit down. That's not what he's talking about. What? I'll dwell in the blessings. I'll dwell in the blessings of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble, like I said before, Brother Brown preached the rapture message and he used this right here. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in what? His pavilion, not yours. He'll hide me in his pavilion and the secret of his tabernacle. What? Revelation. See, this is a secret bride. This is a secret revelation, just like the song was talking about the seek, the revelation. But now we know the revelation has been open. We're living under an open book now. Amen. Amen. And now shall my head be lifted up above mine enemies around about me. Therefore, will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing. Hard to get some of y'all to do that. I will sing praises unto the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. You know, I go back to different places and you see David. Remember what David was? David was, a, he, he wrote songs. And when Saul would have a bad spirit, Saul, Saul in 2020 would have a bad spirit. He called David. And that anointing walked right in there with David. And he would play. And what did the Bible say? The evil spirits would go away from Saul. Make your day better if you sing a few songs. Just saying. I want to make this thing better, not worse. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. Verse 6. And now my head be lifted, though... Now shall mine head be lifted above mine enemies around about me. Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifice of joy. I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. He doesn't mind if you cry. He wants you to ask. He wants you to ask. Have mercy all upon, uh, also upon me and answer me. When thou saidest, Seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, Thy face, Lord, will I seek. Hide not thy face far from me, and put not thy servant away in anger. Thou hast been my help. Leave me not, neither forsake me, O God, of my salvation. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. Teach me thy way, O Lord. That's what we're doing today. Teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in the plain path because of mine enemies. David... David is honoring his enemies for driving him to God because of mine enemies. Listen, your enemies, what's Satan? Satan is your worst enemy, but what is he doing? The things God lets him do is driving a son and daughter of God to God. So your enemies are the best friends you'll ever have. That's tough, but what, you look through all the Psalms. Because of mine enemies, Lord, I will. Because, of, because I have enemies, it makes my friends much better. Teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in plain path because of mine enemies. Deliver me not over into the will of mine enemies, for false witnesses are risen up against me, and such as breathe out cruelty. I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord. You see there? I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the what? Land of the living. In other words, what he's doing all of his day. Wait on the Lord. That's our problem. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. All right? Let's go to Isaiah 59, 18. According to their deeds, according he will repay fury to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies, to the islands he will repay recompense. So shall they fear the name of the Lord. Now, where is the name of the Lord? It's in you and me. That's what the world is missing. 
The world is missing the name being associated with the name. Now, oh Lord, they use that name many times, but it's not a good way. But you and I are totally, eternally connected to that name. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, we know they're going to, the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. And the Redeemer shall come to where? Zion. And to them that turn from transgression in Jacob, saith the Lord. As for me, this is my covenant with them, saith the Lord. My spirit that is upon thee and my words which I have put in thy mouth shall not depart of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, seed, saith the Lord, from henceforth and forever. In other words, it will never diminish. Even though we have been through denominations and we've been out in the world, come through denominations and all the different places, you just kept going. And then God brings you right here to the message of the hour. Amen? So it will not depart. I like what Brother Brown said. He said, you know, some old grandma, great grandma, got on her knees one day and said, Lord, I want you to bless not only my seed, I want you to bless my seed, seed, because you promised that you would continue on and then here you come. Right out of all that, right out of all that chaos. Let's go to Micah 7, 7. Therefore, will I look unto the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. Rejoice not against me, O mine enemies. When I fall, I shall arise. And when I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be a light unto me. Now, do we really believe that? Because we go, we go, no, Lord, it's so dark in here. I know you're not here. (laughs) It's so dark in here, I can't see anything. I think uh, when I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be a light unto me. I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him until he plead my cause and execute judgment for me. He will bring me forth to the light and I shall behold his righteousness. How many of you have went through a journey and went through a battle and and said, why does the heathen rage? Yet when you get to the other end of it, as Brother Bob was talking about the other night, you get to the end of 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 the enemy of, of what you're dealing with right then or a problem. What do you do? You look back and you go, man, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, because I was heading in a wrong direction or I, was, I had this wrong thought or this way I wanted to go this way. And, Lord, you put a little adversity in my way to, train, to change the course. And, Lord, that course was exactly what you wanted me to do. That's why the footsteps of the righteous are ordered of the Lord. Ordered. He has ordered a legion of angels to watch after you. We can't lose, folks. We cannot lose. Then she that is mine enemy shall see it, and shame shall cover her which said unto me, Where is the Lord thy God? Mine eyes shall behold her, now shall she be trodden down as the mire of the streets. I remember remember uh, Gershon Solomon was telling us um, that when he was in the Six-Day War, that remember he was out there in the desert and he got, um, I think a a tank ran over him or he was down low and the tank had run over the top of him, didn't run over him. But he was out there and then here comes the whoever it is, Palestinians, and they're running out there. Remember him telling the story? If you haven't heard it, you need to listen to it. It's on YouTube, I think. But he's he's a soldier and he's surrounded by these Palestinians and he doesn't know if he's going to get captured or if they're just going to pow pow and take care of him. And he said, all of a sudden, they kind of look up. And he said, they drop their weapons and turn and run. And the end of the story was, either he interviewed somebody that was in that platoon or he interviewed, something got, the the, um, story got told that there was angels or people just rose up behind Gershon Solomon. Well, now I'm telling you, buddy, the footsteps of the righteous. You don't know that because you didn't see it. Now, he didn't see it. He was looking this way, looking down a gun barrel. I don't think he was... (coughs) 
thinking about a host of angels standing here, but he said to look on those people's face, and they said, oh, they were everywhere. How many times has that ever happened in your life where you look at something and you go, how did that change? Well, you weren't in another dimension where God was and he had those legions of angels watching after you. Because the footsteps of the righteous, you know what? That was a testimony. If Gershon's life would have ended right there, that wouldn't have been a testimony. But God wasn't finished with him. He's still over there doing his work now in Israel, doing the things he needs to do because of what? Because of a little thing that he went through. Now, that's not something. You and I have never been through that before. I mean, being a soldier in war, knowing that you could die at any minute and that the host of your enemy was around you and their guns were pointed in your face. Oh, we ain't never been through that before. But we've been through those little trials that you see that things have been changed and we don't know that. Well, you don't know what's going on back here. You don't know what's going on in another dimension. Let's listen to Brother Branham. We read this last Sunday. We'll read it again. Number one, Smyrna Church Age. Unless we suffer with him, we cannot reign with him. You have to suffer to reign. Now, I want you to keep that in your mind that, listen, God is not some mad person who is mad at you and He's, he's got it out for you. No, but he knows you're a human being. Right. And being a human being, we lean toward the carnal mind first. And he knows that. But he's that spiritual rudder inside of you needs a little every once in a while. Amen? You want the wind to blow in another direction every once in a while. So you have to suffer to reign. The reason for this is that character simply is never made without suffering. Think of the character building you've had in your life so far. Character is a victory, not a gift. So God's not going to gift you character. He's going to gift you love, joy, peace, long suffering, and all those different things because that's what the Bible says. But the Bible says you're not going to get character. It's not a gift. Character is a victory. Now look, look, character is a victory. Doesn't say anything about a battle. You didn't lose. If you are victorious, you won. You got to look at these things. What's what this, what God's saying to us? <coughs> character is a victory, not a gift. A man without character can't reign. Think about God Almighty that can just destroy this world by snapping his finger. He can't do it because he's got character. He can't do it because of what he said. You say God can do anything. Nope. Brother Brown said God can't do anything. He can't do what his word didn't say. He's got to do what his word said. All right. He can't change his word too, so he can't change his mind. He can't change what's going on. A man without character can't reign because power apart from character, is satanic. See, now, what did God do? He gave permitted power to Lucifer. Yes. Amen. Yep. Told him, you're the anointed cherub. You're the one, the cherub that covers. You walk up and down the earth. You do this. You're my anointed. You're my, remember, we talked about him. You're my right-hand guy. He was given power, though. He didn't have the power. He was given power. And he has no character. Satan has no godlike character. So that's why a man without character can't reign because power apart from character is satanic. But power with character is fit to rule. And since he wants us to share even his throne on the same basis that he overcome and sat down in his father's throne. Now remember, this is the overcomer in this age. Revelations 3. So this is our, what we get, our overcoming, excuse me, is to sit with him, sit down in his father's throne, then we have to overcome to sit with him. And the little temporary sufferings we go through now is not worthy to be compared to the tremendous glory that will be what? Revealed in us when he comes. How's he going to reveal himself? Through your life. No other way. 
except through your life. He can't do it through words. Man has to take words and they've, he's, she's turned, they've, the world's turned it in all different ways. So it's me and you in flesh. It's the God in flesh that's going to destroy the effects of the devil. Oh, what treasures are laid up for those who are willing to enter into his kingdom through a little bit of tribulation. Oh, that says much. Much tribulation. Think it not strange concerning the fiery trials that are to try you. That is what Peter said. Isn't it strange that God wants us to develop a Christ-like character that comes through suffering? No, sir. And we all have trials. We are all tried and chastened as sons. Not one but goes through that. Nobody's immune. Nobody's immune. The church that is not suffering and is not being tried hasn't got it. It isn't of God. Hebrews 12, 6 says, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Now this special condition in Smyrna must be applied to every age. There is no age free from it. All right? Every church age went through some sort of persecution, some sort of trial, some sort of trouble. <clears throat> There's no true believer free from it. This is of God. This is the will of God. And, and it's not the will of God because he's just, like I said, he's a, he's a sadist and he wants to just put everything he can on you. No, he knows what you need. Amen. He knows the way we lean. Sorry, but we do. We lean toward the carnal mind first. Amen. Sorry, we're just humans. We were born that way. But we've got to break out of that and then trust what God said, which is not the carnal mind because the carnal mind is enmity with that or division. It's, it's, it's against it. This is the will of God. It is needful. We need the Lord to teach us the truth that we are to suffer and be Christ-like in doing it. Love suffereth long and is kind, Matthew 5, verse 11, 12. Blessed are you when men shall revile you. Oh, I hate it when somebody says something bad about me. He said, blessed are ye. When men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely. Now there's your key. If it's true, he's telling the truth. But if it's falsely, then it's on him. Rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the what? The prophets which were before you. Now, here's a quote we were talking about last Sunday. The cloudy skies and storms of life are no signs of God's disapproval. So don't sit down one day and say, all this is happening on me. I must not be a child of God. Don't ever say that. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> Neither are bright skies and still waters. Everything's going well. Paycheck's coming in the door. Bills are getting paid. We got a good car. We got, oh, we can go to Walmart and buy $100 worth of groceries. Just groceries? How many of you can get out of Walmart without spending $100? Y'all lying. You, yeah, you. I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about Christine never raised her hand. I mean, really. But you see what I'm saying about per That's no persecution. It's because you can't buy but $50 worth of groceries. <clears throat> but look. So neither the bright skies and still water sign of his love and approval. His approval of any of us is only in the beloved. Now, what is the beloved? This is his word. His love is elective, which he had for us before the foundation of the world. Does he love us? Oh, yes. But how shall we know? Now, how are you going to know that God loves you? We shall know because he said so. And where did he say so at? He said so in the word. And he manifested that he did love us, for he brought us to himself. See, that's the love of God is to give you an opportunity to be part of him. Oh, that's a great opportunity, folks. Goodness. And manifest that he did love us, for he brought us to himself and gave us of his spirit, placing us as sons. Not just bringing us in the fold, but placing us. You know, in other words, having some confidence in you. To do what? To do what the Word said. And how shall I prove my love to him? By believing what he said. Not by 
signs by believing what he said and by conducting myself with what? Hatred. I'm, oh, I'm having these trials and God's so far away. Nope. Remember, folks, if you are going through a trial, God is right there and he is the one orchestrating the thing because when you get through that trial, he's going to cut that thing off. He's not going to let Satan just buffet you the whole time of your life on that one thing. You got something you got to get rid of. Lay it down. <clears throat> Lay it down and go on. I'll promise you there's something else going to pop up. So get rid of that one. By conducting myself with joy amidst the trials that he in his what? Wisdom allows to come to pass. Thank you, God, you sent a prophet that could tell us exactly what you are thinking. Amen? Is that true? I mean, you believe that. Amen. All right, let's go to Romans 8, 15 then. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption where you cry, Daddy, Daddy, this is your, it's your new birth. The spirit of self-bearing witness with our spirit that we what? Are the children of God. <clears throat> and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we what? Suffer with him they might, that we might be also glorified together. For I reckon... That the sufferings of this present time, whatever you're going through, are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature, what? Waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. Like I said before, how are you going to become a manifested son of God without going through this character building trial? Are these character building things? Then what? To be a manifested son of God is when you don't have no food. And you say, God, I need a pantry full of food. I don't have gas in my tank. I got to go pray for somebody. I got something to do, Lord. There's your manifestation. You can, and like I said, you go and spend $100 every day at Walmart just on groceries. That ain't, that's just manifesting you got a good job. You see what I mean? Let's go to James 5, verse 7. Read, read some scripture here, and then we'll read a few quotes. Is that okay? Amen. Be patient, therefore, brethren. Okay, right there it is. Mm -hmm. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husband waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth. Now, you know what? God planted the seed. It just didn't automatically become a tree and start bearing fruit. Right. 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 Process you got to go through. I've waited for about 11 years on my apple tree, one of them, to make big old apples. This year, they made big apples. 11 years, though. I planted that thing 11 years ago. And I'm waiting. I've been waiting. I've been waiting. I've been waiting. And finally, Brother Gay, I got some. I'm going to tell you, we got some big old apples, about that big, good old cannon apple. But I had to wait on it, though. I couldn't just go down there and say, all right, three years later, you're nothing. And you go down there and mow it down with a lawnmower. No, you had to have patience because you knew what you planted. Amen. Think of that. God knows what he planted. Behold, the husband waited for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it until he received the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not one against another, brethren, <clears throat> lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Look, take my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering affliction and of patience. That's like I said before. James is talking about the, well, you've never been persecuted like, they've been per like they were persecuted. You've never been persecuted like the prophets of the old. You've never been persecuted like Jesus was persecuted. You've never been persecuted like Peter, James, and John and all the different ones that gave their life, that died by stoning, that died by beheading, that died by crucifixion. Amen. Amen. All right, it's 1 Peter 2, 19. For this is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. For what glory is it if when ye be buffeted for your faults, you shall take it patiently? But if when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. 
Now, who I mean wants to be acceptable with God? Well, right there is what it is. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. That's a problem for a lot of us. When he suffered, he threatened not. I'll get you when I get done with this. I know God's going to get me through this, and when I do, buddy, you're in trouble. No, see, that's a horrible attitude. You'll never get through that. See, that's power without character. But committed himself to him that judges righteously. Let's look at the layout of sin, church age. <clears throat> Brother Brown says, To him that overcometh, he's reading Revelation 3, To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I overcome and am sit down with my father in his throne. Now, what are we to overcome? That is the normal question to ask. Because that's what we're looking for. Well, we got corona, we got this, we got that, we got this. What do we, what do we look? It's not what you overcome. It's how you overcome it. Now, that's so profound that God had to send us a prophet to say that. That didn't come through Confucius or Buddha or that came from a prophet in the end time to tell us that. And then when you read these things, sometimes, <clears throat> you know, I think when Brother Branham was preaching all the theologians, that's why he had a lot of problem with theologians because the theologians would be going, he's just contrary to everything that we're, we've been taught or are thinking. But it's exactly what God wants us to hear right, right here. Because look, what are we to overcome? It is not the actual thought of this verse, for it is not so much what we are to overcome. Because we do, like I said, we have a laundry list. Well, I overcome that. I overcome this. I can't overcome this. I got this. I got this. It's not what you overcome. It's how you did it. But how we are to overcome. Now, this is logical. See, they're all sitting there going, this is illogical. All the theologians, all the carnal mind. But this is the mind of God. Do you not know that? That this is the mind of God talking to us through a prophet? That's why they call it the voice of God recordings. That's why they call it the voice of God. Sure, it was the voice of William Branham, but it was God speaking through that voice. Now, this is logical. For does it matter? Much what we are to overcome, as long as we know how we can overcome. A quick look at these scriptures, which involve the Lord Jesus overcoming, will bring out the truth of this proposition. In Matthew 4, wherein Jesus is tempted of the devil, he overcame the personal temptation of Satan by the word and by the word only. In other words, he didn't bring some kind of great, uh, he didn't just say, all right, devil, you can't speak. Or he could have. He had power over the devil. We know that. But how did he defeat him? He defeated him by the word. That way, me and you can do the same thing. Right. Yes. Like, me and you can quote the word back to the devil and by the word only. And each of the three major trials that correspond exactly to the temptation of the Garden of Eden, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, Jesus overcame by the word. Eve fell to the personal temptation of Satan by failing to use the word. Adam fell in direct disobedience to the word. He knew what it was, and he walked out anyway. But Jesus overcame by the word. And right now, let me say that this is the only way to be an overcomer. Glory. What? Overcome by the word. Right. Amen. Also, it is the only way that you can know if you are overcoming because that word can fail. Now, notice again how Jesus overcame the world systems of religion. When he was repeatedly badgered by the theologians of his day, he constantly applied what? The Word. He was always quoting the Old Testament to them. It is written. It is written. It is written. Problem is, is they're going, yeah, we know, but that's not what we're interpreting it as. Same way the people, what about today? Same spirit was there then as here now. <clears throat> he spake only what the Father gave him to speak. There was not a time when the world was not utterly confused. By his wisdom, for it was the what? Wisdom of God. All right, let's right here. Speak to the rock, 1953. There's no such thing as death to a Christian. 
That's why this, we, we come here to this, and this is going to be close to the end. We, that's what I didn't get to last Sunday. <clears throat> we come to this part that we say, oh, all right, well, every, we, every trial, we can handle every trial, but boy, there's death. Right? There's no such thing as death to a Christian. There's not one scripture in the Bible. Now, what do you say? Take it back to the Word. There is not one scripture in the Bible that tells you a Christian dies. Right. Right. Who are we going to depend on? Amen. The world or the Word? Very much contrary. We're all alive. Jesus said, he that believeth on me has everlasting life. Is that right? How can it have an end if it's got everlasting, see? He that heareth my word and believeth on me and on him that sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but look, but has passed from death to life. That's true. So we can't die. We cannot or can't cease to exist. Amen. Once you're born again of the Spirit of God, you can never, ever cease to exist. Amen. Oh, you can be separated in this dimension, but you're just coming right back in here in a glorified condition, will always be. There was a time when you wasn't nothing or anything. Now watch. Here's another one that you can get a scholar to say this. But there, was n there never will be a time but what you'll be something in somewhere. Let me read that again. There was a time when you wasn't nothing. In other words, you were in the mind of God. You weren't just a thought in your parents' mind. Didn't know you were coming. Didn't know your name. Didn't know if you were going to be male or female. Understand what I'm saying? <clears throat> because you came by natural birth. But now that you're born again, there will never be a time but what you'll be something and somewhere. You've passed from death into life. You're going to be somewhere from this. All through ceaseless ages, all eternity, you'll be somewhere. Boy, I like that. Amen. That means you're not lost. Everybody else that's lost means what? They don't know where they're going. Right. And they surely don't know where they're going to end up. Right. But boy, we do, don't we? Amen. So now I just think about that sometimes when trials get hard. This is a prophet talking. I hit snags. In my life? Oh, no, Brother Branham, you, no. I hit snags in my life like everybody. Some hard trials we have to pull hard to get through it. You know, sometimes we forget that Brother Branham tried to take his life a couple of times. Without the grace of God, could have been a murderer. He was going to shoot that boy. He said, I was going to shoot the boy. He didn't say I was going to try to. He said I was going to shoot the boy. He was going to actually do something to that guy that poisoned his dog. You see what I'm talking about? He was human. Thank God he was human. But when I'm up against it, I just think of this. Well, <laughs> what difference does it make? <laughs> that didn't get to you? You're looking for something so profound, and Brother Brown says, when I'm up against something, I just think, well, what difference does it make? The Bible said, and he took it right back to the Word, all things work together for good to them that love him. Is that right? So maybe it's for my good. So I just go right ahead and take it anyhow. Oh, boy, we don't want that. We don't want to take that. This is what Brother Brown's telling us. And if, I, if it, there's nothing can bother you. Even death itself can't bother you. When death comes, though, I, the old prophet, when they was building the scaffold out there to cut his head off, why, he said, death, where's thy sting? Grave, where's thy victory? No sting to death? No, why? Where, where, where's your victory, grave? Grave said, I'll have you after a while. I'll get you. Paul said, what can you do to me? <laughs> That's it. Well, what are you going to do to me? 
Well, I'm already I'm already a child of God. What are you going to do to me? Second Corinthians four verse fifteen. For all things are for your sake, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. In other words, we've got to all go through it. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. <clears throat> That's why, folks, we need these persecute. We need something to remind us to pray a little harder, to study a little harder, to not say, why me, Lord? And we don't want to be where we say, pour it on me, Lord. Right? Because we're human. But we want that balance. And the only one person knows that balance. Me and you do not know that balance. God's the only one that knows that balance, and he's got his foot on that rudder. And he knows what we need, and he knows when to let off. <clears throat> for our light affliction, this is 2 Corinthians, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. You want the weight of the world or you want the weight of glory? We got enough of the weight of the world. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are what? Temporal. <clears throat> but the things which are not seen are eternal. Let's listen to this last quote and then the musicians come. <clears throat> I, just want, I just wanted to put these two sermons in here because I sat down one day and I just kind of put myself in David's place. I'm an anointed king. Now, he didn't get all puffed up about that. I mean, you anoint most people and go, well, you're going to be the, why? You know, not you, Brother Donnie, but most people without the right character, that'll make their head get about that big. And even though he was a young boy, he had to grow up to be a man. He had to go through that character building. Most people would have run and jumped up on the throne and sat there and had Saul killed and everybody else killed because, bless God, I'm king. God told me I was king and I'm the king. Now, listen, you can't rule and reign like that. But, you know, but listen, folks, the inward man does. Yes, that's right. The inward man, but by character, you hold that power. I've always said many times before, we come up to this place of speaking terms with God. If you don't have the right kind of character... If you don't like that guy, if your neighbor's been giving you trouble or your boss has been giving you trouble or that person cuts you off on the side on the road and about runs you off the road, you know what? What you speak is what God's going to have to honor. Right. Right. Yeah. Elisha and the she-bears, right. the different things, that's why power without character is satanic. Yeah. But when you come to the power where you can hold that power back, And not and not and not uh, not let it be rage, because that's what we get. We get mad. But see, if your own speaking conditions, all you got to do is say something wrong, and you've done something wrong to somebody. Jesus Christ could have stopped the crucifixion any time he wanted to. He even told him. He said, "I can bring a legion of angels." And just wipe this. You're talking about Romans, and you're talking about your army? But what did he do? He said, I'm done. I'm here to do a job, and I'm not going to revile back. I'm not going to say a word. I know I can stop it, but I'm not going to stop it because I got, some, I got some kids inside of me that needs to be birthed. So what about me and you? What about us having long suffering, even with our own natural children and all the different people? But I look right here. <clears throat> but that's why I kind of came up with this, and I hope it helps you some. I hope it helps you in your daily life because we live our daily life a lot more than we live here. Right. Right. Amen? Right. Now here's Brother Brown praying. Now, Lord, heal the sick as they come up to be prayed for this morning. Give to them that joy that they long to be well. 
let them know that this little light affliction was put upon them is just a little testing time. God knows all about it. He did it to see what you'd do about it. Oh, he did it to see what you'd do, we'd do about it. How God, may they step right out there and claim that finished work. May they not provoke you by be running here and there and in and out. Well, I don't know this, that. You know, I don't know, I don't know. No, you better start knowing something. Lord, may they take a straight stand and say, Lord, you was the one who saved me. You was the one who did these things for me. I believe you, and I'm trusting in you today, and I pray that you'll grant this to the people in Christ's name. Amen. He prayed this prayer right before he had a prayer line. He was getting the people ready. Look, he did it to see what we'd do about it. May they step right out there and claim that finished work. These light afflictions is just a little testing time. God knows all about it. Sometimes we think we know more than God does. Sometimes we want to say, well, I don't know why this is. I, I know why this is happening. I don't know why this is happening. I do know what this is. I don't know what that is. I don't know about this coronavirus. I don't know about this. I don't know about that. It's a light affliction compared to what a lot of people are going through. <clears throat> There's people in foreign countries now that that are beginning to starve because they're not getting any food from us or not us church, but us United States. I was reading the other day, let's stand our feet. Musicians come. I was reading the other day, one country, their food's been cut off. Not their food, all their food, but the food for their children's school has been cut off and that's the only meal those children got in a day. One meal is all they got, folks. Here we are. We got candy in our pocket. We got food in the car. We got a pantry full. We eat three meals a day. And you've got countries that because of this coronavirus is not, that's just not, you know, they're not, they're not affect, sorry, they're not infected with it. They are affected by it because we can't get stuff over there because of all the restrictions and all that. There's children that are starving because they were dependent on that one meal at school that they ate, and that's all they got the whole time. So don't worry. I mean, we go through these light afflictions, and there's things that, that you know, we're looking at a, at a tough road ahead, but you know what? The tough get tougher. Amen. 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 We keep going. You've got to know that God knows what to do, and he knows what you need. We don't. But God does. He knows what we need for the hour and the light affliction, afflictions and trials that we're going through is to give God honor and glory. I mean, who, you going to give the devil honor? Oh, my, no. Uh-uh, no. Because, look, the devil would have killed Job right at first if God would have let him. Oh, you got a hedge built around him. Right? He said, okay, I'm going to take that hedge off and let you get to his family and let you get to. But what about him? No, nope. God said, no, don't touch his life. Why? He still had that hedge around his life. He may have removed it from all of his personal things, and God may do that to us, but until God's done with us, that hedge is right there around your soul, that inward being, that life in you is not a normal human life anymore. Right. I want you all to realize that. Now, it doesn't make you so special, like I said, to make your head blow up, but you are special to God. Amen. You have a part to play, a piece to play, and you're part of the body of God, and we can't lose. Amen. We can't. There's no way, like, like Brother Brown said, there was a time you were nothing. Didn't know where you was going. Didn't know what you was going to do with your life. But now that you're born again, you'll never not be somewhere or have somewhere to go. Never. 
So thank God for that. Yes. Even though the trials, but remember, do we go back to that where he says, what we overcome? No, it's how we overcome it. So we overcome it by the word of God, what he said about us, and believe what he said. doesn't matter. Come what may, folks. The bride of Jesus Christ will make it through. We will make it through because he promised us by this word that someone will stand in the end time and say, death, not just even where's your sting, that's all been done away with. It'll say, death, you have no part with me. Even the temporary things we go through. Don't you think Satan will want to kill every one of us? Look how he's attacking the ministry of the, of the message of the hour, making, them, making people sick and all these different things. But it's like God did. He said, okay, I'm just going to open this up just a little bit. I'm going to show you what kind of character they got. But you can't touch their soul. You leave them alone. You can do all these other things. But you know what one day he's going to do? He's going to close that back around. And he's going to say they proved their self. Satan, they've proved their self, and you have no part with them. Let's sing this song. God bless you. We'll get back on the two, two spirits. I hope Brother Dale's ready next Sunday to take a crack at it. So we'll see. Paul, who can understand why I am so happy and free? Jordan to Canaan's fireland, and this is like heaven to me. Out. The devil don't believe it, I see. But I feel with the spirit there isn't a doubt, and that's what's the matter with me. Oh, this is like heaven to me, praise God. This is like heaven to me. I've crossed over Jordan to Canaan's fire. Amen. I thought we're supposed to be sitting in heavenly places. Sitting in heavenly places already by the baptism of the Holy Ghost, which has taken us out of this. And thank God. Thank God. He has taken us out of this and set us up in a place where Satan can't touch us. He cannot do anything to a child of God without God allowing something for your good. Jesus said, why in the world would a father, if a child asked for a, a, a fish, would give him a serpent? Or ask for a bread, my kids are hungry, and give them a rock. No, he's going to give you the best bread. He's give us the best bread right here. He's give us the word of God. And we must believe. We got to start. We're believers. Don't we do what believers do? We believe. That's what believers do. Believers believe. Unbelievers do what? Unbelief. <laughs> it's kind of simple. Sister Alicia. Thank you. I just want to mention a little bit just give a testimony on my mom's death. Just really quick. So can I give a quick testimony? Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, come on. Y'all be seated. You can take that off. There you go. So you can hear what you're saying. You guys, it's been like a really hard journey for me and my family. My mom has been like really sick on and off of COPD and heart failure. I feel like it's for like the past two years. She's been sick like all of her life since we were young. Like she would be in and out of the hospital. But the Lord blessed us with like, um, I guess like the past two years, we've seen her have some really good days or some really good months, seeing her looking really beautiful, really strong, really happy. 
But then like this tragic thing kind of happened to her. She fell down at home and she hit her head and her nurse wanted her to go to the hospital. So she went ahead into the hospital. Um, as days went to a week, we thought she was gonna get out, like everything's gonna be fine again. So we've seen her raise up many times. When she's almost looked like she was in a coma-like state, my mom was risen back up by the grace of the Lord through prayer. Amen. I've seen God raise her up so many times. But this time was a little bit different. I guess like with all of the um, COVID virus and everything, we couldn't go visit her at all. She ended up being moved from the regular hospital. One day I talked to her on Thursday night. I can't say the dates right now. I can't keep up with dates. But I was like, my mom was talking really well. I was like, mom, I had to go home. She's like, yeah, I'm about to go back home. So we're just all happy and everything. She'll be getting out. But the unexpected, it took like a big turn. Instead of her going home, it's like a few days later she was sent, or the next day she was actually put into intensive care. We still couldn't go see her because of the rules. And it was like very, very hard. We couldn't go visit her. First of all, well, do I still trust you, Lord? You know, I trusted him through everything. I can't say that a day without joy when I finally was able to see her, but she went to intensive care. And then like days went by, they put like a tube thing in her neck, like a catheter thing, and they put it through to her um to like check on her lungs and her heart, like see like, where the fluids were collecting and her making what she couldn't breathe properly. And when they did that, I guess a couple days past, she was still in intensive care, they're trying to help her. So it was the most strongest oxygen they could possibly put on your nose, like to put that pressure through. That still wasn't helping. Her lungs still kept um, collecting up the fluids and they didn't realize they couldn't help her anymore. There was no more help for my mother from the medical field. I mean, it was just, it was heartbreaking, but I'm telling you, I still was holding on to God, said, God, you were real. Lord Jesus, I know what happened in Brother Branham's prayer lines. You know, I've heard it all. I believe it. God, if you want to raise her up, you can raise her up. But I guess, like, after all that happened, we were contacted. Our mom's contact was about hospice. They start pressuring her to go to hospice because they can't help her anymore. And then also, there's a double pressure. If she didn't go to hospice, we couldn't see her. And we still didn't all get to see her. Only two people at a time were allowed to see my precious mother. I'm telling y'all, if that is something hard, that is something hard. And the first time I had to see her with my husband, I just had to. I got a chance to pray with her, to really, this is my testimony, I really had a chance to pray with her, to read the Bible with her, to bring my Bible. Like, I actually gave her to my Bible, I gave her my Bible temporarily. I was like, Mommy, going to borrow this until you are healed in Jesus' name, and you can come on back home. Because I was praying for a complete healing. So mama, she had many hardships. I mean, she really tried her best to raise us with what little she had. She had a mother who would sacrifice everything for us. My dad was not really around as we became teenagers at all. They were never married. He was not really a moral support, spiritual support, or any way to my mother. She went through a lot. She went through a lot for us. I really thank the Lord for her as my mom. She was a good mom to so the best that she knew how to be. And I wouldn't change it. You know, the Lord knows. But as time went on, she went, she, oh God, y'all just don't even know. My mom was like, you and Chanda, my mom calls me TC. I go by TC to my whole family, to my old church I used to go to. But as I became a little bit older, my kids got a little older, I started going by Elisha, my middle name. But actually my whole family calls me TC. That's my nickname. So I'm used to that. But I just didn't come here with that. I just kind of felt, I don't know, just new. <laughs> and um, she was like, TC and Chanda, y'all have to sign this hospice paper for me to go in. We couldn't do it. I could not do it. My sister said my hand would not allow me to do it. My sister said her hand actually cannot force her to sign these papers for her to go to hospice. So we both couldn't do it. So I called later because my mom, she can't decide. And me and my sister, we cannot do it. We will not sign this hospice paper. After that, my mom, with a little bit of strength she had, she signed the hospice paper herself. So she can go ahead and say, Mama, it doesn't matter. The hospice, the hospital, intensive care, God can heal you, Mama. In Jesus' name, I still trusted him. I mean, he saved me, a wretch like me. There was nothing good in me. I testified the truth. Nothing was good in me. It's just his grace. I don't need to go through the complications of it. It's only his grace and mercy. He showed me his love. And by his mercy and his tender mercy and grace, I was able to hear. Able to hear what he was saying unto me. To be able to be saved. And I knew it was the truth because it was the truth, the truth, the truth, the full truth. Nothing was hidden, how a woman should be, to take off the makeup, to wear a dress. It wasn't a halfway truth. I went to a halfway kind of church before, me and him, and I was like, wow, that could not move me. Nobody could change me. If I want to dress how I want to dress, I have to do it. Even, even I loved him, he could not change me. I loved him with full love, but it's like 
I got to do what I got to do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Amen. But when I heard that real truth from the message about how lady should be, it's like, man, it's not like the full truth. Like, it doesn't seem like there's a part way. It's the whole, the whole truth. So I trusted with mama until the end by his grace. And when I went to the hospital, when we finally got there, I just, I didn't realize that. I was like, well, so I was a hospice nurse. I was like, I still trust God for mama. I trust God he can raise her up. I was so positive. It was like so refreshing. Not anything good in me. But then when I look back at it, I wish I would have recognized the signs from my own heart. I recognized the signs that God might take my mom home. The man was trying to tell me it's a contract. I was like, I'm not hearing it. I trust God. God can raise my mother back up. That was me. I'm not going to lie to y'all. I was just like that. God saved me. He can raise my mom up and give her a chance to have a happy life. I want to see my mama home. I want to see her have a husband that loved her. I want to see her serve the Lord. He's like, well, there is a beautiful woman. She was a gorgeous woman. Gorgeous, but she went through so many trials. But I know God is in control of it. But yet, even in though it's like this, I said, look, brother, I know if God still is in control, if he wants to take her home, he can take her home. But I'm still holding on. I'm not going to bury my mom. I'm not going to bury my mother. I was like, even when they showed me paper of signs, I would show the doctor, like, is she on this sign? On the last day, my sister was there. We were there together, my brother, together in the hospice alone yeah. on the last day of my mother's life. It was so hard. Yeah. I like showed the doctor, say, I will not speak these words. What level is she on? Hours, days, or minutes? Where's my mom at? At the last moment. So I was like, where is she at? They told me, they were like, she was like, well, maybe hours, days, or not minutes. So me and my sister went back to the room. Y'all, I'm going to tell the full truth to all of y'all today. I'm an eyewitness of this. Me and my sister were eyewitnesses to my mom's death or her passing on. We were right there. It's nothing you want to behold. It's nothing you want to be there for. It's nothing I want my children to be there. I'm like, Lord, take me quickly if you are taking me. Because we were in there. We came back from the doctor. They pulled us out of the room. And my mom was by herself for a few minutes, a few, so a few precious minutes. And I showed the doctor. I said, hours to minutes, hours to days. I mean, she was like, well, in the hours, it could be hours today. It's kind of in there. Me and Shannon went back to the room. We started talking about my old brother, who just passed two years ago. You, many of you guys know him. He was 35 years old. His name was David. Extremely handsome. Tall. Like, everything probably a girl would want. Very handsome. But the Lord chose to take him. The Lord chose to take him back in 2018. It was very difficult for my mom. So me and Shannon were actually in front of mama. Mom was laying down. Me and Chanda. We was talking about David. was like, man, what a shame. Man, David is gone. We wanted him to have everything. He was like, our last words. I'm seeing her thinking, Mama has hours to days. But these are the last words we're saying. So I'm just telling the truth. I'm not going to lie. We're just like that. So I'm so sad. I'm just so sad. She was like, maybe you have not gotten over it. You know, you weren't here for the funeral. You know, you didn't get to go to the funeral. Because we were in the Philippines at the time. Like, maybe just not over it. Because so I was like, my sister's like yelling at me. Don't you see the reality? Mama could have, Mama could have. Chanda, I trust in the Lord. God is going to raise mom back up. I'm trusting him. But if he chooses to take her home, at peace. But on the last day, me and John were there. I want this the most important part, the most important part. When we came to see her, like two days before she died, my mother said, like, God is the healer. She is trusting God. Her life is in with God. Because believe me, I'm going to tell you all the truth. I drove my mama crazy about the Lord. I was like, mama, you got to make it right. Have you made it right? Have you made it? She's like, baby, baby. You know, this is a mama would. You know, like, man, you keep asking me this stuff. I was like, mama, have you made it right? She said she has made it right, so I know she's on the, on the other side. Amen. She's just waiting for us. She's waiting for my sister to get right. So I ask you guys, I beseech you, pray for Chanda. That is my younger sister. Chanda and her husband, Daniel, that the Holy Ghost will just rapture them up, that the Lord will speak through you and bring that word across. It doesn't have to be anything but me, but I'm praying in Jesus' name to get a hold of her. She made a promise. She's going to get saved. My brother died at his funeral, but she hasn't really walked with God. I said she's too busy. Her life is too, too difficult. To try to give everything to God. So I asked for that prayer. But as we're there talking about David, my mom started coughing. I won't go through every detail. Me and Chanda ran to mama. Like, mama, mama. And some different things happened. I was like, is this okay? We started blessing for the nurse. We looked outside. Like, oh, you know, nurse, 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 come and help us. They never came. It took them a long time. Then they finally came. Mama was gone. She breathed her last breath. And she was gone. And my testimony on death, because I'm not going through the graphic details, it's so humbling. 
Do not think you are somebody. That is my testimony. Do not think you got some money. Do not think I have a good job. Do not think you look good. Don't think you have these things with this world. When mama is gone, mama is gone. You hear me? Mama is gone, y'all. It's my testimony. It doesn't matter how it comes across. I'm telling the truth, but I know, but I know she is on the other side. I got to talk to my sisters like, Chanda, don't you want to see mama again? Don't you want to see her again? Thank you, Jesus, when mama was still breathing. I said, Chanda, don't you want to see mama again? David is over there. You know, we have my grandmother is over there. My grandma said, I'm in, baby, I'm in. Just what she told me on the phone. She said, she is in with the Lord. So all of them are on the other side. Mama is just waiting on me and my sister. So I just tell y'all, she is in, but death is the most humbling. There's no dignity in death. There's no pride in death. There's no station in death. When I saw her breathe that last breath and the different things that came to pass that are associated with death, I was like, wow. God, you are almighty God. You are all I have. You are everything to me. You are my breath. You are my every step. You are my every thought. You are what is keeping me. So I want to encourage you young people, even my own children, not just other young people in the church, that it's real. We don't have anything. We can't hold on to this stuff here. We don't have anything. The only thing we have is the Lord. Amen. So if anything I could say, y'all, just keep holding on. Keep holding on. Yeah. I'm telling you, there have been moments, boy, I'm like, I cannot wait to get to the other side. The streets of gold are so real to me. I can't wait to go. <laughs> this world is so hard. It's so hard to live here. I'm just tired. I cannot wait to go. Because I know everything that's wrong will be made right. Amen. I can't wait to be where it's made right. This is my testimony. I love you guys. I just, I just want to share it with y'all. I felt like I had to share it with y'all. I was in the liberty. I'm at home. I'm at church in the presence of saints. Amen. Amen. It might not be there for, be like that for me elsewhere. Amen. So I can just testify to y'all. Encourage y'all. You know, her death's not in vain. She was 66 and the Lord showed me something when I was there. I thought mama was 65. I'm just being honest now. Just my mama. I was like, mama, <laughs> mama is 65. And her little machine thing, I seen 66 there. I said, Mom, you are a full Bible. That was before she was dead. In my heart, the Lord gave me that little nugget in my heart. Oh, Mama lived a full Bible. And so that blessed me. And I know she's on the side looking beautiful, healthy, hair bouncing, everything, you know, just, just the way as it should be. So I'm not as many dreams for Mama, y'all. I was like, Mama, you're looking so good. I was like, well, you just, you just serve the Lord. God bless you with a good husband. You know, I just want to see her just be, to be happy, you know. They had a joy that I could have having a Christian husband. I want her to get a chance to have a taste of that. But that is a tiny taste of heaven. Amen. When you are married to someone you really love, you guys, I would encourage each one of my yeah. kids, and they don't want to get married right now. Yeah. You know how it is today. Okay. But, y'all, when you have someone you really love that stands by your side in the wrong, in the right, on your ugly side, on your beautiful yeah. side of your nature, Amen. and he's still standing by you praying for you, and hold your hand, baby, calm down, calm down, when you're going through different things. Man, I'm telling you, it's an amazing thing. It's a little tiny taste of that heaven. I can't say it compared to it at all. But I thank God for him. Amen. Yeah, he's nothing but a blessing to me. He's never been a curse thank to me. You. I just want to testify about that. But y'all, I just want to encourage y'all, don't give up. Amen. The devil wants us to give up. He wants to look at earthly things. He wants to look at what we don't have, what we should try to acquire, see what we want to grab, what we want to get. He's not going to go with you. Right, right. When you breathe that last breath, that, breathe that last breath Amen. that is it. It's not coming with you. So just try to make it right. If you got anything hard on your heart, try to make it right. Amen. And I just love you guys. I thank y'all for my church family. Thank y'all for praying for me. I really needed every single prayer. And we still mm. I still need the prayers now. Because yes. we got many battles ahead. So please pray for us. I don't have to go through it, but please pray for us. Amen. I Amen. love you all. Amen. It's a battle. Yes. But it's just a battle. The war has already been won. Let's stand to our feet. We'll be dismissed. Just remember our sister and her family. And uh, pray that the Lord will give us the right words to say while we're down there. It's like Dad always says. He says, you kind of have a captive audience at a funeral. You don't have many people ever get up and leave while you're speaking, so you can just hammer them away. <laughs> Time to get right with God. Right. Amen. And that's true, brothers and sisters. You breathe your last breath on this side, whatever you are when you breathe that last breath, that's what you're going to be wherever you wind up at. Yes. Amen? So we know, as being a Christian, 
we're going to breathe our last one on this in this dimension, but then when we start breathing over that other dimension, it's it'll never be the same. It'll be the most fresh. We just don't know. We we just don't know. We just don't know. But but Brother Branham told us when he went across there, he said, "Do I have to go back to that?" <laughs> Do I have to go back to that? So that's what we're looking forward to. God bless you. Let's bow our heads. <clears throat> Just pray for the family this weekend. I mean this week, in the middle of the week, Lord. Be with, uh, I pray, Lord, that you'll be with Brother Luis, Lord, as he speaks Wednesday. Lord, be with each one here. We pray, Lord, that you would take what's been said, Lord, and go deep into our heart, Father, and we'll ponder the things of life. And when the enemy does come in like a flood, Lord, you, you've already made the standard and raised it up, Lord. We're Christians. We're your children, Lord. And sometimes we do, as like David, we lay across our bed and we cry ourselves to sleep, Lord, or we, we cry out to you, Lord, but you're right there, Father. This is all character building. This is all something that we need. As you sent the prophet said, we need this. This is needful in a Christian life. So, Father, it's not a bed of roses. It's not a playground. It's not a picnic. It's a battle. And, Lord, but we know that the war has already been won. When you stepped out of that tomb and said, all power in heaven and earth has been given unto me, well, guess where that power is now? That power lays within the bride of Jesus Christ. You, Father, to destroy death. Be with us and take care of us, Lord, on the highways. Be with the ones that are sick, Lord, the ones that are not here. We'll come back together on Wednesday night, Lord, and be refreshed and ready to hear from you, Lord. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed. God bless you. Take up your cross and follow Jesus. Oh, take up your